Today's lecture is about web components and what in elements. The overview of today's lecture is three parts. So what is exactly web components? What are the building blocks of that? What are the technologies that make web components work? And then what in elements? So if you want to do some web components, we also have something for you to, to use. Basically, web components is component-based web development. Wiki lists this or defines web components as a set of features that allow for creation of reusable widgets or components in web documents and web applications. The key parts I have highlighted here, the first one is the blue one. It says currently being added. It's not something that is there and is going to stay. It's very likely that within a few months things will look slightly different than they look today because it's still in the process of being implemented. The second part is the reusable widgets or components. I think it's, it's the whole purpose of it is to be able to kind of take parts of somebody's web page or some use of something on a web page and then apply it to our own. Bringing component-based software engineering, it's a tricky one because HTML is like a declarative format and bringing components to it, it's, it's a challenge. I think it's, it's worth trying to make it work. So what exactly are the web components? As I said, it's a technology built on existing elements. The first part is custom elements. So we want to have an API that allows us to use custom elements. That means the ones not defined in the HTML standard. Second element is the shadow DOM. So we want to hide the details of that particular custom element that we have implemented just not to expose anything. We want users of that part to just use our custom tag and that's it. They shouldn't care what's really inside, how it's generated. And it's of course needed for composing different elements. So we want to be able to reuse them in compositions as well. Once we have that, we should be able to, you know, use that on our page. So we should have HTML imports. And finally, HTML templates, so parts of DOM that we can reuse from one place to another, we can copy them. These four elements, like web components, is built on top of those four. This is how it currently looks. This is the most recent data taken from webcomponents.org. Uh, there are five major browsers. You can see that some of them are quite okay to use already and a certain other browser is not. We are developing modern web applications, we're using web components, and still we have to target browsers. So that is kind of counterintuitive, I would say. So here comes Polyfills. Uh, Polyfills is enabling all of those features in all of those browsers, which makes everybody happy, I hope. So what exactly is Polyfills? It's a JavaScript library. Fortunately, all the browsers, they have JavaScript interpreter and they can run JavaScript and it's about the same in all of them, like the performance wise and computation wise. So we can use JavaScript to fill the missing gaps. This gives all the required features, so the HTML templates, the shadow DOM, uh, custom elements and HTML imports to all the browsers. Well, it says here evergreen, so I guess only those that are actively maintained. The disadvantage is that it's like extra 117 kilos that your page has to load. And that might be a bit problematic if you really want performance and fast loading times and so on. What is good is that Polyfills actually detects what is supported by the browser. And they said that as the implementations of those features are common across the browsers, then they are going to decrease the size of Polyfills as time goes by. There is also a light version available. So if you want to use only custom elements and HTML imports, you can get that. And if you want, you can target particular browser or your particular needs by making a custom build. Using build tools provided by the web components or you can ship your own polyfills version. And you just use it as any other JavaScript and it's recommended to be the first script that the document is loading. Just to ensure that all subsequent imports and, and elements and contents of your page will work. Let's go a bit into details about those web components and what are the parts of it. So let's talk about custom elements. The date you see in the upper right corner is the latest revision of the draft 
of the W3C consortium. So it's kind of fresh. Like I said, this is an evolving topic. They are making numerous changes to that draft and that affects implementations later on. What is a custom element? As you can imagine, it's just the stuff that you put into the tag markers and it has something that is not defined in the HTML standard. So by definition, it should be all lowercase so that people can use only lowercase names. It must contain a hyphen or a dash. That's how we distinguish that this is not a standard name. So if it contains a dash, it's a custom name. And it must not be reserved. There is a total of eight tags defined by SVG, so Scalable Vector Graphics and MathML, that contain dashes in the name, and you can't use those. I think it's font face and something similar to those, so most likely you will never come across that name. The specs also allow adding custom attributes for existing elements, and we use the same kind of pattern. There is all lowercase, we have to include a dash, and this time we prefix it with data. If you need to extend an existing element with some specific data for your web component to use, you can stuff that into attribute called data dash, and then whatever you want. HTML imports, it's basically a way to include HTML documents in HTML documents, and those can include other HTML documents. So you get a chain of imports as you would do in any other programming language, with the exception that HTML is not a programming language. It's done by adding a new relation keyword in the link element, so you just tell that it's an import, and then you specify the path to a file, and that's it and it's imported by your browser with all the other stuff that is imported by that document. And the specification actually lists the whole process of what should be imported in which order and how to resolve conflicts. And then HTML templates surprisingly is part of the existing HTML standard and it's implemented by all the browsers. The purpose of a template element is to declare some content that can be then copied by the scripting language. So by itself, it does nothing and it's not even rendered. So it's the scripting language that is responsible for making use of stuff that is declared as template. Finally, we have Shadow DOM. As I said, this is a technique to hide certain parts of the DOM. And in general, this is actually combining multiple DOM trees. So we have a DOM tree defined by our custom element, and then we have a DOM tree that is our document that we're displaying that element in. So this actually allows to do this, to combine one DOM element with another, and it uses concepts of a shadow host and a shadow root. So a shadow root is the root of our element, and the shadow host is something that we place in the document itself. And then when the browser tries to render that, then it doesn't render the host, it renders the shadow root. As I said previously, this hides the details of an element and exposes only the relevant part. So it's kind of like defining an interface in Java, for example. Public API that you can use in a custom element. And of course, there is a library. We can use it as a kind of reference implementation. It's Polymer. And these are web components for modern web. The latest version is from 29th of September. So it's also quite fresh, I would say. It's a library for building custom elements that contains quite a significant bunch of already defined elements that probably fit 99% of the business cases that you can ever encounter. It's built on top of web components, so it requires polyfills to be cross-browser. So it's not that you just import Polymer and then you're done. You have to also remember about polyfills. There is a separate app toolbox for building progressive web applications. Overview of Polymer is this. It's eight different parts corresponding to different aspects of software. So there are elements for, for example, core elements, which support form, buttons, and such. Then the paper elements is the material design by Google. They are supposed to look like nice and eye-catching and so on. Then there are components for Google APIs and all sorts of things. It is possible to build a fully offline application using Polymer. So you can have something that runs in a browser but doesn't require internet connection, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a web browser. But you can do it, it's possible. Then on the other hand, it is quite useful to add <coughs> offline support to your application. So what to do when the data is lost or when the connection between your application and the service is lost. Then having some offline support, like querying the data entered by the user until the connection is restored, it's actually quite useful. This lecture is not about Polymer anyway, it's about Vadin elements. So let's quickly go through what Vadin elements are. 
there are two offerings in that. One is core elements and it's Apache license, which means it's free, it's open source. You can go to GitHub to read the code and commit stuff if you want to. There is six different components. Not all of them are found in, in Polymer, but they are supposed to work with Polymer. So they have a similar look and feel as the Polymer apps. We also support Angular 2 bindings. If you want to use them in Angular 2 applications, you can do it. And later in this lecture, I will tell you how you can actually bind it with any other programming language that you want to use. And then the commercial offering is charts. So we can have a charting library that displays all sorts of charts. If it's configurable, it independent of the data source. It produces nice results, but six elements, as I said, the one that is showcased the most, it's Vadin grid. It's basically the tabular data. So it displays the stuff in a grid. I hope I can show you a demo. So there you go. This is, this is a grid, what you see here. And it works purely on the client side and it, this is a web component. So as I said, this is intended to be used by business applications. So the performance is essential, especially when you're using a lot of data. There is like a bunch of features you can use with it. You can sort, filter, or render cells differently. You have add secondary sorting if it's ever needed. We can resize the rows or the cells. I'm not sure. We can even rearrange them and Probably we can also hide some of them if we wanted to. And this is all lazy loading. So it fetches the data only when it needs to and the data is displayed. And it's memory efficient. So it only takes as much data as it's displaying plus minus few rows above and below. Then the second element is the combo box. It's basically a filterable drop-down select, nothing fancy there. It supports keyboard navigation. What is very important is that it's compatible with Iron Form. You can use Polymer Forms and then you can just stuff Vadin Combo Box into it. And again, it's optimized for large data and the data source is completely irrelevant. That's Vadin Combo Box. The title of the slide shows how you are actually using that. So you just make a, a tag which says what in combo box and then you stuff some data as attributes and then you bind some JavaScript to it. If you go to vadin.com slash elements, then you will reach the homepage and then you can read. There is actually quite an extensive documentation and use examples about each of those components. Then we have Vadin Upload, and this is a support for multiple file uploads at the same time, and it's fully configurable. So you can specify what are the allowed types, how many parallel uploads is possible, where to store the files. There is like a huge number of events that are triggered while the thing is being uploaded. So an error, a finished upload, canceled upload, a lot of those. Then we have Date Picker. This comes surprisingly often when developing any application that sooner or later you're going to need a component for selecting dates. This is our let's say, web component for that. It's to some degree customizable. It just is a scrollable calendar. Well, actually it's up down scrollable where you can just select dates. You can customize what are the ranges of that and so on and so on. And then we have a split layout. It's supposed to partition the layout into something that you can resize. It works like Vadin split component or split layout. So you have two parts of either horizontally or vertically, and then you can resize it and you can nest it and so on. It has a support for mobile devices. So the places where you can actually touch are highlighted on mobiles so that it makes it easy to swipe uh, and resize then. And this is our most recent Vadin element. So the currently released version is 0.1. It's kind of fresh and I would expect more features to be added and as the component kind of matures. Finally, we have Vadin icons. This is actually not a web component as such, but you use it as a web component or in web components. It contains well over 500 icons and new ones are added from time to time. It's designed for web applications. It's supposed to be simple and our UX markets that it favors sharp corners. And as I am not a visual person, I have absolutely no idea what it means. And to me, corners are usually sharp, but maybe it's different in UX world. I don't know. Anyway, you use it through iron icon. So we're using polymer icon element and there is just a tricky way to make it work. 
from my personal experience, it's actually a surprisingly huge boost in UX and the overall look and feel. If your application contains icons, not everywhere maybe, but in those crucial places where you know you have buttons or you have some sort of important things, it gives a nice clue to the user that, okay, well, this is something that maybe I should click and I already know what is the outcome of that because it shows an icon with an exclamation mark. That kind of indicates that it's not something maybe safe or then if it contains a, a check mark, then it's a button that confirms. It's surprisingly big boost in the UX. I promised to tell a bit how you can actually bind web components with other frameworks. As you have probably guessed from what I said so far, web components are done on the browser. So it's the client side stuff. So it's HTML imports, it's JavaScript. This is what is handled by the browser. Many frameworks operate on the server side. Vadin is an example, but there is Ruby on Rails, there is Django, there is PHP even, and that all works on the server side. How can we use Vadin elements or any web components with that? Well, we can bind the events that those components broadcast with Ajax requests, and then that should do it. The drawback is that for each of the frameworks, you have to do it yourself, unless there is a ready-made pack or component that handles this for you. For finding elements, there wasn't, and I can show you an example, and I'm, I'm going to brag about it. It's self-advertising, so if you go to my GitHub account, and if you search for finding elements there, then you will find a severely out of date, unfortunately, Ruby bindings to Vadin elements. So if you're a Rubyist and you like to use Sinatra, which is a lightweight web application framework, then you can use Vadin elements with it. And you don't have to do the bindings yourself, like the JavaScript bindings to server-side code, because I've done them for you. Anyway, what is done is that there is a bunch of view helpers, a code that you enter in the Ruby code or in the Ruby view that gets rendered as an element with some predefined attributes to capture all the events and send them to the server side. Yes, and this is done basically through generated JavaScript code. And the responses from those Ajax requests, they are either painting a new content or most often they are just passed as a JSON to some predefined and generated handler that updates the web page. And this is basically the pattern that you have to follow if you want to have web components in other frameworks. So if you want to have server-side bindings or server-side availability of your web components, you have to capture the events and then you have to provide a way of making the responses update the actual component. So about the demo for today, web components are evolving really fast. Polymer has new releases basically every month. Among those releases, there are those that change the existing code base. So it's really hard to track the recent update. So I updated my code in May, which is five months ago. And since then we have the pre-release version of Vadin Elements 2, and when I started coding, it was beta of 1. So it's like the whole new generation of Elements is coming, and my code isn't yet ready for the beta version of the first one. And this is unfortunately what happens with like all the technologies that are emerging. Anyway, my demo seems to be more or less working, so I can hopefully show you at least a glimpse of it. This is Ruby. This line that I'm currently at here, it shows the helper. So this is Ruby code, this part here, which will be generated as HTML of a Vadin grid with all the bells and whistles attached so that changes to the state of that will, you know, call the server. And this is done for also for Vadin combo box. It basically means that changes to the, to the combo box should be posted to this address. Let's maybe run this. I did that as a proof of concept to show that I actually can do it. And since I play a card game called Magic the Gathering, then I thought that I'll just, you know, use it to showcase. If this really works, then you will first see the outline of the page, and then as the imports are actually resolving, you see that here are no placeholders for combo box, and here is nothing for the grid that should be there. And as the imports are downloaded, then the actual content of the page is updated. Anyway, this is our grid, and as I said, it's lazy loading. You can see that I have scrolled a bit and it actually called the server, or it's still calling it to prefetch some data. It's actually calling the server to get the data when it's really needed. So 
I can have like million of rows, well actually it's 16,000 rows, 16,181 to be precise. Anyway, they are all on the server side. None of that has been given to the browser yet. And then as soon as the browser doesn't need it, then it just is dispatched. So it doesn't occupy the memory. It just takes enough memory that you have there. And the same goes for the combo boxes and stuff. So you can select things here and as things are happening, then then you can see that something has been sent to the server in here and then the response is been, being updated here and then it again prefetches some stuff to display in the table and i can show you the source code of this page so how it's generated and well here you see a bunch of imports but never mind those uh, what is important is this part here so here you have a vadin combo box so our custom Vadin element, which, well, it just has an ID so that I can refer to it. But here is the script part, and this is, this looks really ugly because it's auto-generated, but it's setting up the component. So as I said, this is client-side technology, and using it from server-side requires you to unfortunately generate some JavaScript that you can call in the browser, so that the component, you know, gets updated with the data that you have sent to it. The same thing goes here on below with the Vadin grid. Some of the elements, they accept attributes. For example, for grid, you can specify the number of rows that you want to display at the same time. But other stuff, unfortunately, has to be configured to JavaScript. Personally, I think this is a very nice feature and nice future of web components, is that you will have a bunch of really useful components because Polymer is a huge library. There is like really, really big number of, of components there and they look really nice out of the box and they provide some customization options and so on. And to be able to use that in any server-side application, regardless of, of the particular language, well, that's, that's really awesome. Anyway, that's it for today.